All right. Good morning, everybody. Wow, this is exciting. Thank you for being here on a Saturday morning in September. Hey, if you're out in the foyer, you guys come on in, grab a seat. Uh, my name is Pastor Rob. I'm. Thank you, Nick. <laughs> you can always count on Pastor Nick to do that. <laughs> um, I'm one of the assistant pastors here at Calvary, if you don't know me. Welcome to our event this morning. I'm very excited about what God is going to do. I admire you for being here today. This tells me that you have a heart like the Lord Jesus. Um, Jesus said in Matthew 25 and verse 40, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you've done this to the least of one of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. And what he was saying was that he cares about every single person and every single need. And that any time one of us meets even the simplest need in his name, showing his love, it's just like doing it to the Lord Jesus himself. That's a pretty wild thought, isn't it? And so we're going to learn this morning, uh, we're going to get educated this morning about a problem that uh, we have in our community and all around. And we have some local experts here, and I was thinking about that term, experts. The reason I call them experts are because these are some men who have really committed their lives to meeting these needs, to being used by God in some really specific, powerful ways to show the love of Jesus Christ to people in our community. And we get to hear from them this morning and be inspired and motivated, educated, trained by these guys. And the goal is that hopefully all of us here today are going to go out with a new commitment to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength and to love others as we love ourselves no matter who they are, no matter what their needs are. Amen? What we're going to do now, you guys, just for a couple minutes, and this is up to you, but I thought it'd be cool to open it up for a little Q&A, okay? And so I'll stand here and moderate and let you guys sit. Um, let's ask them some questions. You got something you're wondering about or anything you're wondering? Yes. Okay. Okay, I think I understand. So two things. I'm going to repeat this for everybody. One is I believe you're talking about the RAIN project, mm -hmm. and I'll let one of you guys mention that. And the second thing, if I could summarize, is what should we do? What's the appropriate thing to do when we see maybe an area that's been kind of become really messy? Uh, what's the appropriate way to respond? Maybe one of you could answer each one of those. Like who knows most yeah, who, about the RAIN project? Who wants to do the RAIN project? Yeah, I could do I, Yeah. I, I, yeah, the, the Rain Project's in Camarillo, and Rain Project rocks. It's awesome. It's a ministry, and uh, you can go online and just type in Rain Project Camarillo, and you'll get all kinds of great information about the Rain Project. It's a really great project. They also have a, a section that works with emancipated youth. It's another big problem in our county. If you don't know what that is, that's, um, that's uh, children without a last name. That's what I call it. They're, the foster care kids have been bounced from family to family, and about 80% of them, when the funding ends, uh, those families kick them out at 18, and they become homeless. Imagine your 18-year-old son or daughter with no place to go. Now, when they kick out, they go, oh, I can handle it. I may only get a little bit of money, and then within a year or two, they crash and burn, and they end up on the streets. The women are either trafficked or pregnant or 
pretty beat up. The men end up, the guys end up in gangs. The Rain Project tries to take them in. That's one of the things they do. It's also part of our program. But that's the Rain Project. Um, and um, you would be blessed if you wanted to. It's one of the many great things that are happening here. Thank you, Amanda. Or did you? Um, I just want to follow up with what Sam said. They're amazing. We refer lots of people to them, and they're actually a working program. So they're for families who want to get their lives back together. They sit down with them. They help them with uh, scrub resumes. They help them with mock interviews. They'll get them prepared for work environment again. Um, so it's really just a place for families to become themselves again, get their feet back on the ground, and then move forward into permanent housing. They're a wonderful organization that we're lucky to work with. Yeah. So what about this issue? We see an area that's getting really messy from some folks. What's the right way to approach that and respond to that? Uh, I'll answer that question. One of the reasons, uh, again, we create Project Hope in the city of Camarillo is, is to actually address issues like that. The nice thing is what Amanda and I have been able to do is collaborate not only uh, with the city of Camarillo Public Works, uh, but also the county, uh, with other municipalities that actually deal with those type of issues. Uh, and, and just realistically, if you have a situation like that, the pamphlet that, uh, that's in the back that I had earlier, it has my cell phone number on the back. I know you're like, my cell phone number? Not my personal, oh, I have to go nuts. Uh, but I have a work cell phone. You can call that or text it. Or, or there's a work number, or even another thing you can do when you see stuff like that, just call the non-emergency sheriff's dispatch number, say, hey, we noticed this, could you have an officer check on it? And really what you can call it is like a check the well-being. And the reason why I say that is because we don't always know uh, where people are staying, where people are camped, where people uh, are in their cars, uh, if they're in hotels or not. The only way we know is because the community calls us and lets us know, or, or they call patrol. And, and again, I say non-emergency number, that would be, if you remember this, it's 654-9511, that's Sheriff's Dispatch. Uh, I can give it to Pastor Rob later for those of you who want it. But you just call and you say, hey, there's a camp, it's, it, whether it's dirty, trashy, whatever's going on, or they leave stuff behind, that's what we're here for. Uh, that's why I'll go out, I'll assess the situation. Sometimes we've found holes in the ground where they were making like tunnels or their tree houses. Trust me, the city, uh, Caltrans Public Works, that's basically who we work with to help out. And it's also a way for us to engage. If we don't know the person, we say, oh, okay, hey, I didn't know you were out here. Uh, what can we do to work with you? And again, every situation is gonna be different once we assess it from there. I wanna say one, one other thing, uh, man. We, uh, where do people that are homeless sleep? Where do they sleep? Where do they sleep? All over, right. wherever they can. What do they need? You. I mean, you know, we, years going into the river bottoms and um, uh, for every one crazy guy that's out there, there's nine they're trying to survive. And so, you know, you, you hear this, what would Jesus do? I would ask you, what would he have you do? The first question we should always ask ourselves, what would he have us do? Now, um, I'm not suggesting you do something dangerous, but I, I would suggest that maybe he would have a few of you go and talk to that person, get to know them. Trust me, they really have a first name, contrary to public opinion sometimes. And um, uh, if we really believe in the power of the Holy Spirit, if we really believe the power of the word, if we really believe it, now's, now's your time. In Jesus' name, go talk to someone. What if you were to clean up their camp? What if you were to do it? A neighbor? Forgotten neighbor? You can call the police. But what if you were to help them first? See if you could help them first. Start a relationship. Um, I just want to challenge you. The ones in our congregation and the ones that have done that have been so blessed. That's all I have to say. Okay. You see why God is using these folks, the passion they have for the Lord and for the lost? It's beautiful. Okay, another question. Yes.
on this. Let's, okay, so let's put that into a, a question. Um, some folks we see that are homeless do have emotional or mental issues. Some of them need to be on medication. They refuse to take their medication. They end up out on the streets because of that. What's your response to that? Um, I'll start on one aspect, and I'm sure Amanda and Sam will, will go into another aspect. For those of you who don't know, it's, it's actually the severely mentally ill is actually the hardest population to reach in every community. Uh, it's just not our community, it's nationwide. Um, prior to starting this project, I actually did a lot of research and they said that's actually the hardest group because sometimes, sadly enough, they don't believe that they have mental illness. Sometimes, sadly enough, they're so clouded by their mental illness, they don't think they need help. Uh, they don't know how to take their meds or they don't think they need meds. So that's really the, the biggest concern that we have is because how can we work with them? What's the barrier? What's the breakthrough? How can we facilitate some type of a contact or an interaction with somebody to be able to have them, really it's about, as we keep saying, it's about building rapport. There's one lady in town, for example, uh, her name is Sherry. I know you've all seen her. She usually wears big heavy uh, jackets. She's over at Constitution Park. She's got lots of, she has lots of makeup. We get calls from the community all the time. Well, why is anybody doing anything? Why isn't it? Trust me, we've had Mental health services, which is another a great part of our team, behavioral health will actually go out with us. There's behavioral health techs that will actually go out and do a one-on-one -on -one meeting. Um, the sad thing is, is they're not effective, uh, or she gets mad, or sometimes she'll talk to us, sometimes she won't. Sometimes she'll talk in a third person. Uh, do we know that's what she needs? We totally need to know to help her out. But as I've said before, for the last two years, all Amanda and I have done, and, and Ken Porter and Antonio Rodriguez and all these other people, we just tried to build a relationship with her. Matter of fact, when the community calls me, I said, hey, can you do me a favor? Can you go say hi to her? Because God is definitely going to use somebody to connect with her somehow uh, so she can actually come out of this state that she's in and just, you know, build her. If it just means bring her a cup of coffee, bring her a cup of coffee, bring her a cup of water, bring her water, bring her something to eat, sit and talk. Whatever it is that God's calling you to do, what we look for is who's going to be that breakthrough and who's going to be that relationship while we're still doing things in the background, while we're still working with public works and cleaning and doing all this other stuff, wherever she goes, she's, and I, and I have to say this, when you call the police and the sheriff's department, our first action isn't to enforce. Our first action is to identify, assess, and educate. That's really what we've, what we've done different. So when you call us, don't think that we're just gonna come in like the Gestapo. Uh, we're actually coming in because my guys and gals that are working out there know that we have to get the information in order to start a working process with uh, whoever this is. Yes. And Joe answered it perfectly, actually. One of the biggest things that we can do is just interact with them, talk with them, let them know that we're here. We give them food, we give them water, we give them support, and we continuously go to them. Sherry is one of those ones that isn't the hugest fan when we call right. up and say hi, but we still do, and she knows that we'll always be there for her. Yeah. And it's just letting her know that she has that support system. So when she is ready and when she needs any other type of help, we're right there to help her hold her hand through the process. And I'll just say one other thing, just, just to give you perspective on mental illness and homelessness. Uh, first of all, did you know there's 13,000 homeless, new homeless every month in LA County? Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, some of them were previously homeless and they're coming, they go back on the street. Um, it's a huge issue. And, uh, and it, just to give some perspective, how many people in a church have mental illness? How many people are struggling with depression? That's mental illness. So just kind of walk through the, first of all, the extreme cases where they're absolutely right, but that's a small percentage, once again, of the homeless population. The problem, church, we have to break through is to categorize all homeless as right. Sherry, as this one lady, because that's what happens. We just automatically want autopilot and say they're all like that. 
Nothing could be further from the truth. Right. Nothing could be. That's such a small percentage that are chronically, their mental illness is so great. But for the vast majority of them, I know I would have mental illness if I lost everything, was in my car, because that's what happens, then uh, you're, you're on some sort of, of uh, you know, maybe unemployment. The unemployment runs out. You, you got kicked out of your home because of the debt, like just like real life. Now you're living in your car. Your car breaks down. You don't have a money to fix the car. It's stuck somewhere. It gets towed away. Now you're on the street. You don't have an address. Your family's checked out. They're not involved in your life. And you're now on the street. I would become pretty depressed, I think, if that were my life. Now you have no possibility of getting off the street. Oh, and, um, and you, know, um, you know, I wish there were more police officers like Joe, you rock, man, but uh, a lot of tickets. They'll start getting tickets for loitering and being in certain parts of, particularly in Ventura. Now they have all these traffic fines and all these tickets. So uh, it's really a difficult situation. And uh, a lot of the mental illness is very curable. Um, and uh, it's not that they don't take their medication. Uh, so, yes, they don't take, some of them don't take the medication. But when you get to a place where you're that stuck, you're not able to do anything. But you come alongside them, you get to know people, you can help them get back on life with things like medication. Medication alone doesn't solve the problem of homelessness. Just to give you guys some perspective on that. Thank you all. Pastor Brian. I know a lot of uh, believers are worried about receiving money to help someone that's see a need and we think, you know, if they don't look trustworthy, I'm not sure what they do with it. But I always struggle with the words of Jesus in Luke 5 where it says, give to everyone who begs from you, and whoever takes you from your goods, don't demand them back. And so I know we're supposed to do this with wisdom and our doing this care pack today, but what would be your guys' wisdom on how we can obey those words? Yeah, let me repeat that for the recording, I think. So uh, should we give money to folks that we see? What should we give? How do we balance uh, the, the boundaries we might want to have with what Jesus commanded about giving to whomever asks us? Uh, what do you guys think about that? For a lot of people, that's one of the biggest questions that they come to me and ask, um, how, how do I give? And I tell a lot of people, give to the community that's, that's helping the homeless, give to the shelters, give to the social workers, give to the organizations that are helping them, that are funding them um, to help them back on their feet. Um, they look for, the homeless look for the help they struggle and they know that they, they need an outside force to assist and without, without any type of funding, uh, Lutheran Social Services is a nonprofit. We run on grants um, and soon as we're gone, there's no one in the Caneo Valley um, to help the homeless. Um, so really I say help the organizations that are there to truly benefit the homeless. Uh, I'll go, I'm sure Sam will want to say something. What do we give is usually the question. Sometimes I don't know. Uh, they may ask for money, but that's not really what they want. Uh, they may ask for food. They might not really want that either. So what I do is I just think, God, what do you want me to give? The gentleman I'm talking about, I was talking to yesterday, he just, he's homeless, he's been out there, he's got mental illness. Matter of fact, and I like the way that Sam said that is, He's got mental illness to the point, not severe, but to the point where he's thinking about leaving his wife. He was thinking about, he was contemplating suicide. He thinks he's going crazy. He blacks out. He yells at people. He's hitting the other homeless. He's acting violent. And God, during that hour and a half's time, basically broke whatever change of disparity, anxiety, depression, everything that he had. By the time we were done, we prayed, and it was very powerful. God and Christ asked me, Joe, I want you to give him your time. So what Amanda says is very critical, too, because, as I mentioned, LSS is funded by you. It's a nonprofit. Kingdom Center, City Center, St. Vincent de Paul, those organizations that you don't know that are doing that work every day, that's really where I say the money should go. Let them assess 
Uh, do they need a utility bill paid? Do they need a, a rent payment? Is it first and last? Uh, is it groceries? They even have grocery cards that we give out, gas cards. Those are the things. And now let me just, I, I have to say this because that's where the, the worry comes in. There are some people on the flip side of the coin, again, very small percentage, who actually take advantage of that. Absolutely. And God actually put me in a position, not only in a, in a social service-minded perspective, but in a law enforcement capacity to assess what those situations are. There's one gentleman in particular who was sitting at one church and over a month and a half's time, I think it was like a month and a half, almost two months time, they gave him like $1,500. Food, gas, food, gas, food, whatever he needed. When they realized, hey, this guy's not doing anything, he left, went to another church, 1,500 bucks, 1,500 bucks, 1,500, because he chose, he chose not to change. He chose not to work with us. He chose not to want to make his situation better. And I'll be honest with you, every single time we've come across people like that, I don't treat them any different than another person. I said, hey to this guy, I go, what do you want? What do you want to do? What are you doing instead of taking? Because what God, and I tell him, I'll say, hey, let's, let's make this a give and take. What can we do together? And it's really, it's always about having them see their own self it's because they don't understand who they are. That's why they just ask for whatever they get. And sometimes it is counterproductive for us as far as when that happens. But I don't care because he's in control. I'm not, I'm not worried about that. So That's awesome. I agree 100% with what you all said. It's right on the money. Um, so, uh, yes, if you give them money, the chances are high they'll go get drugs. It's, that's a high possibility. Not all the time, but it's a high possibility. I know this because of the thousands we worked with, and they would tell us that. That's what they do. Um, but uh, how many people have we shared our faith with that have rejected the gospel? Do you stop sharing your faith? Good point. Uh, you know, I, so, uh, well, that person, I'm going to stop. You know, they're, they're obviously going to reject the gospel, so I'm not going to share it anymore or be it. So, again, that mindset that says, in a case-by-case -case basis, what is the Lord asking me to do? You know, um, one of the things that I, I really like about what was said, one of the things that we did at our church is we put together a card. And I would encourage you to do that. Put together a card with all the services that are available for that homeless person. And when you see one, hand it to them and give them an opportunity. Give them an opportunity to go someplace that might help them. Our Gabriel's house is a shelter for women. There should be no women on the street. Um, and uh, really, um, there are places, the Lighthouse and Gabriel's House in Oxnard. This church sponsors, sponsors uh, Gabriel's House, and, uh, and it's awesome. Um, women especially, women with children, um, give them opportunities when they're flying a sign to give them an alternative. So that's another thing you can do on a case-by-case -case basis. Look for what God would have you do. And, you know, I, I've given money to people, and I haven't. But I've always tried to, when I see somebody, give them, you know, some opportunity to, uh, to do something. You know, and, you know, sometimes it's not possible. So can I just, I just the Lord to, leads you. Yeah, I just want to say one last thing. You know what to give them? Give them hope. Yeah. The Holy Spirit's going to define what that is for every individual person. Give them Christ. Yeah. But, but the whole thing is, and again, I just said this, and I'll just end on this, is it, it's got to start with you somewhere. Right. If it doesn't start from you, it's not going to be genuine. Um, because they know, and, and I know it's been, it's been talked about, I'm sure pastors here have all talked about it. You know a fake Christian when you come across one. And if you're just trying to give because you feel you have to give because you're a Christian, that's fake Christianity. Christianity is a full contact sport. That's why we get in the game. That's right. So, thank you. <laughs> all right. I'm going to hog. There are more questions, so these folks are going to be around afterwards. I'm going to hog the last question. Um, and then... If you have other questions, and I know some of you do, you can talk to them. But just real briefly, if there is one thing, this is for each of you, if there is one thing you want everybody in this room to leave with today, one thing, <laughs> right, what would it be? Seek the heart of God. What does that mean? Seek the heart of God means nothing else should matter. When each and every day your focus is Him and Him alone, He'll reveal your greatness in you. He'll unleash the gifts to unleash the power that is actually resting in each and every one of you when you seek him first and foremost it's not about gifts it's not about what we can do how we can look it's not about possessions it's about knowing his heart because his heart defines who you are 
I would say the homeless are, we could easily be in their position. I have guys that worked at Amgen that were scientists that now are on the streets. It could happen to any of us in a split second. Give them, like Joe was saying, give them that hope, give them, give them the love. Um, that's what they need right now. And you guys are here, which means you care. Ask the Lord what he'd have you do. Mm -hmm. Ask the Lord. All right.